Hello, everyone, and welcome to VSA Online. So very happy to see you all here. And uh, today I'm very happy to host uh, Christoph Stockel from uh, Graz University, or Graz University of Technology. And uh, so without any further delay, so I leave the floor to him. Hey, Christoph. thanks uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, uh, I come from the lab of uh, Professor Wolfgang Maas from Graz University of Technology, and I'm going to talk about uh, our recent model, which is the Cognitive Map Learner, or a CML in short. So let me start out with some motivation. And um, the idea for us was that we initially wanted to start out to uh, introduce an alternative model uh, to classical RL approaches um, but with a focus on flexibility. So usually in reinforcement learning, um, people want to maximize some reward and therefore they uh, optimize a policy. And uh, of course the policy then yields uh, actions to maximize a specific reward. But uh, once the task, for example, changes, one usually has to change the policy or update it or optimize a new one. And basically with our model, we wanted to find an alternative which uh, yeah gives better flexibility with respect to changes in the task and um also our, for a model the there was a target to have a uh, neuromorphic hardware as a platform so there were some restrictions we had to we have to use uh, local learning rules uh, also because we're from a computational neuroscience background uh, that's of course of interest um and uh, no back propagation uh, through many layers, because that is uh, usually uh, yeah, problematic to implement on neuromorphic hardware. And so the key idea of this model was really to uh, really create uh, this uh, high dimensional vector space, uh, which is the state space, as I will call it uh, in the talk, which really is the world model and not uh, just have a neural network, which learns a model of the world. And uh, yeah, this uh, world model, which is the vector space, should then also be usable for subsequent planning tasks. So that was really the goal we were trying to achieve. So let's dive right into it. The Cognitive Map Learner, or uh, CML, um, really can be thought of as working in two different modes then. So there is a, a learning mode where the CML learns a so-called cognitive map, which uh, comes this is from a modern neuroscience uh, part uh, where people believe that uh, or we know that um, a lot of animals uh, form a cognitive map of the environment where they have like place cells uh, to yeah figure out where things are located and more recently people also believe that this is not just um, yeah bound to uh, spatial navigation but there might also be cognitive maps of concept spaces then and um, for our purposes this cognitive map is really just a very high dimensional state space and uh, I basically use these terms now interchangeably then. And um, the second mode, uh, therefore, of the CML is uh, planning. And uh, here, basically, this previously learned state space should be used to solve arbitrary planning tasks. Uh, so this, this differentiation between learning and planning is not really very strict. So technically, the CML could also learn during planning, but it still makes sense to think of it as two different modes uh, for simplicity then. So the main components of the model are there's an observation from the environment, like in a classical reinforcement learning setup. Um, and this observation, O of t, is then embedded into this internal state space. And we call this S of t then. This is the state at the time t. There's also an action, which is A of t. And this action is then also mapped, importantly, into the same uh, high dimensional state space using a different embedding matrix V. And uh, you can really think of it as um, these observations are basically embedded uh, into points in state space, while the actions are more like vectors in state space, which move the observation around. So basically, by taking actions in the environment, this corresponds to some movement in the internal state space of the CML. So how does one learn such a cognitive map or how does one optimize the state space? And this is usually done uh, using self-supervised learning where the CML uh, predicts at every time step the next state. So more precisely, these matrices Q and V are optimized to make the next state prediction more accurate. 
So this is uh, governed by what we call principle one, which basically says that this uh, Q uh, times uh, OT plus one is basically the state embedding of the next observation, so, um, which should be roughly equal to the current uh, state embedding uh, or state uh, plus whatever impact the current action has. And um, graphically, this looks like this. We have the environment, which yields this observation. It's embedded into the state space. And then we add to this uh, the impact that an action has. And this gives us the prediction of the next internal state. And then in the next time step, um, we actually know what the next state is because we get the next observation. And we can compute a difference prediction error. And this difference prediction error can be used in the self-supervised learning uh, to improve uh, or to optimize this matrix system. And we can do this uh, using the so-called delta rule, which is nice because it's a local plasticity rule, uh, where basically you can see it's uh, just a learning rate times this uh, error uh, term. And here it's interesting to note that uh, basically this matrix V, which uh, accounts for how actions move you in state space, um, is optimized such that the prediction matches the next state. But uh, the matrix uh, Q is actually optimized such that the next state matches the prediction. So we really try to come at this problem from both sides and make sure that one consistent state space can be formed. Uh, also, uh, matrix V is uh, usually normalized column-wise, and uh, this has the effect that uh, every action moves the CML in state space by the same amount, although this is not really something yeah, we were still figuring out to what extent this is required or uh, can be relaxed sometimes. Um, o of T and A of T in this model are usually one not encoded, uh, although this is uh, also not always true. So I'll show an example where O of T is then not one not encoded as well. OK, so how does planning work then? For planning, we give a target observation O star to the CML. And the CML will then basically um, try to compute uh, the state embedding of this uh, planning of this target observation, which is the target state. And then it just computes a vector basically in state space pointing from the current state to the target state. And then what it does is it uses what we call principle two, which basically says that the useful actions are actions which are similar to the target vector. So the vector pointing to the target state. And Similar is, uh, in this sense, just uh, computed with the dot product. So basically, if they point roughly into the same direction, uh, they will have a higher dot product, and uh, therefore, it's it's more useful. So we compute the utilities, uh, this usefulness score for all action, and then we also add an uh, affordance check because not uh, all actions might be available in all uh, parts of the environment. Then we have a winner-take-all circuit, which basically then selects the uh, most useful available action. And this is our action A that is selected during the planning phase. So before we dive deeper into the CML, it's uh, useful to have uh, one of the yeah, key uh, demonstrations in mind, which is about abstract graphs. So here the problem is uh, really this general problem of uh, finding shortest paths on abstract graphs and a lot of different tasks can be can be formulated as that. And um, the environment that we consider here is just a random abstract graph with 32 nodes. It's undirected, it has two to five edges per node. And traversing an edge in one direction is uh, considered to be an action in this uh, task. Now here you can see uh, a random a uh, plot uh, of these uh, uh, of this graph that we're using, and uh, as you can see, it it looks quite messy. There is no structure to how I, it's it's plotted right now, and uh, if if one has to go from one node to an arbitrary target node, it's not very obvious how this uh, would be done. I think. So if one wants to solve this, uh, the gold standard uh, usually would be to use something like Dijkstra or A star search, which is also similar to Dijkstra, but it has some more, uh, some heuristics which help prioritizing uh, uh, which branches to search for first. And um, these algorithms work really well. Uh, they usually, as they always uh, give a shortest path. 
uh, but they are offline algorithms. So that means that uh, in order to take an action, um, you first have to find a complete trajectory to the target uh, node. And um, this can of course take a while if one if a lot of uh, edges have to be traversed. And it might be problematic for real-time applications when there's only a limited time budget uh, before an action has to be selected. Also, it requires uh, knowledge of the graph. So you actually need to be able to manipulate the underlying graph to, to run that. And uh, the CML, on the other hand, uh, is online in the sense that, uh, that selecting an action always takes a constant time, no matter how far it is away. And um, also, the it, it requires to just have like experienced trajectories of the graph. So if you just have some random box on the graph, uh, the CML can build its own internal structure of it and uh, use that for planning. So yeah, it learns, uh, our CML learns from random box here. Uh, there were 200 trajectories of length 32. And uh, here you can already see the yeah result uh, of what happens uh, after learning. Because on the left, uh, you can see the graph basically uh, projected uh, into 2D vis uh, via TSNI of the random initialized state space before learning. And after learning, um, you can see that it has a lot more structure, basically. So uh, it, you can already intuitively see that there is now a lot more a sense of direction in this uh, 2D uh, yeah, TSNI embedding. And uh, of course, the CML uses for planning a high dimensional uh, version of the graph where yeah, the sense of direction is uh, even better than. Right, in the planning phase, um, the CML is placed on an arbitrary starting node, and it has to then navigate to a given target node. Um, on this graph, we found that the performance was uh, 3.5 on five steps on average, and optimal would be 3.464, which is uh, slightly worse, but it's uh, still uh, pretty good, I would say. And uh, here you can also see the, see the relation between the next state prediction and the average number of actions that are required to find the target node. And one can see the better the predictions get, the fewer actions are required to find the target node or the shorter the trajectories are that the CML can find them. Right, um, so let's uh, look at uh, how these things are uh, similar to, to VSAs then with the graph task in mind. So principle one already has uh, some quite strong similarities because it uses this concept that you basically add two high dimensional vectors, which is uh, basically creating a superposition of these high dimensional vectors to predict the next state, so to say. And you can think of it uh, like this, of course, because the CML really tries to build uh, this, uh, in a sense, data structure of a graph, but in a, in a way that it then facilitates planning. And therefore, if one uh, has this starting state as one, and uh, one adds these, uh, the impact that action one has, one should get to the roughly get to the uh, state as two. And of course, this can be chained. So if you add more and more action impacts, you should um, get to the corresponding state, like when you traverse the actual graph. And this goes as far as if you actually take a full circle, uh, then all of these action impacts should actually cancel out and you should roughly end up where you started. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a consistent state space. And um, so we actually found that this uh, concept of um, cycles uh, is uh, that you take a go back basically in a cycle and you end up where you started uh, holds to be true. So even for very large cycles with length 20, for example, uh, you can see that the prediction error is uh, the mean squared error in uh, state space is uh, still something like, uh, so, so the, you can see it's a low number because the uh, y-axis is scaled by 10 to the minus four here. So the predictions are, are quite accurate here. Um, then uh, the second uh, uh, important concept is for principle two is that it uh, uses a dot product similarity, which is also oftentimes used uh, in VSAs to really figure out which action should be selected then. And here um, you can see the utilities. So these uh, yeah, scores how useful actions are 
to actually move towards a target state uh, plotted on the graph. And you can see that especially the, the edges uh, pointing from the starting node, which is this black dot, to the star uh, node, which is the, the target, they have a high utility scores. And especially in the third time step, you can see that really just the, the two remaining actions are uh, considered to be very useful, while the others uh, have values which are more close to zero, which would mean that they are somewhat more orthogonal in state space. Right, and uh, secondly, it's important that the CML really creates the state space in a way that it has a sense of direction. So basically, when you take an action, you really can get closer to the target state. And um, this basically means that there has to be a distance relationship in the uh, in, in the abstract graph, which basically means um, the so the distance between two nodes in the abstract graph would be how many edges you need to traverse to get from one node to the other. And this has to translate as well into state space. So for the nodes which are further apart in the graph have to be further apart in state space. And if we analyze this, we can actually see that this is the case. Um, and there, there's this uh, relation that also, yeah, nodes that are further apart in the graph and require multiple actions to get from one to the other uh, are also uh, further apart in state space then. So we also tried uh, this on other types of uh, graphs with different challenges. So uh, for example, there were graphs where multiple uh, paths led to the goal and they were of same length. Uh, also graphs with a lot of dead ends and small work graphs. And I think especially small world graphs are of interest uh, here because uh, if you look at the initial state space, it's hard to tell that it's even a small world graph. Even just after the CML has learned it, uh, it becomes obvious that uh, yeah, there are these densely connected clusters of nodes which are sparsely connected uh, among each other then. And on these uh, graphs, uh, the performance of the CML was actually the same as the extra, so it always found a path uh, of the shortest length. Right, we also tried to extend this to weighted graphs, um, where the task is not lo no longer to find a, a trajectory of the shortest length, but actually with the lowest cost. So now to every weight, there is a cost uh, associated with it, and it's, there's, there's some links to uh, reinforcement learning here because these could somehow uh, be used uh, to represent rewards. And um, this can also be uh, dealt uh, with the CML in a way because uh, this affordance check that I mentioned at the beginning uh, doesn't have to be just a zero or a one uh, if, if actions or edges in the graph are available or not. It can also be a more of a continuous value which uh, discounts um, edges which are more costly than others. And in this case, for, for uh, the graph where we now added these uh, weights, one can see that the CML would then choose a trajectory which is actually a bit yeah, longer, but uh, actually less costly than, yeah. So here the performance on this graph was uh, 22.73, average cost where 20.18 would have been optimal. Um, now, apart from abstract graphs, there is uh, also other tasks that uh, this model can handle. And um, yeah, they have, one of them is in spatial navigation, which is uh, not really surprising because the whole yeah, concept of uh, cognitive maps uh, emerged from spatial navigation. And here there are some differences to abstract graphs because in spatial navigation, uh, symmetries exist. So you can exploit uh, symmetries to some extent. So basically taking actions in different parts of the environment will have a similar effect, which is not the case uh, for abstract graphs then. So now we consider a 2D environment in this task where there are now four actions, which I will just call A, B, C, and D. So yeah, the CML initially has no idea what they really uh, do, what, what they mean. And uh, it can now walk uh, on this uh, 2D environment and it receives um, what we would say are sensory stimuli, which are now represented by all of these different fruits and vegetable icons. And they're also just uh, one hot encoded vectors then. And here uh, there are 22 trajectories of uh, yeah three actions each is what the CML gets for learning. 
Now here uh, you can see on the left side what the CML really receives as a training input, which is this list of 22 uh, trajectories. On the right, we can actually zoom out and look at the real environment from the bird's eye view. And we can see what the environment looks like and how these trajectories, these 22 trajectories really uh, yeah, were taken in the actual environment. And keep in mind, this is something the CML never really sees. So this is something it has to infer just by the list on the left. And um, now I want to show an animation of how the state space really emerges. So how it's, it can be, how it is learned uh, during the learning phase. And now keep in mind, uh, or I want you to uh, pay attention to the icons of the kiwi and the nut, and also the, this peach and the orange on the right side, because there, there is no connection between them. So for the CML to really figure out the spatial location uh, of a relationship between these uh, observations, it has to infer it using a lot of other trajectories all around the ring. And this is why it will take a bit longer there. So um, let's look at the animation. Right, so we can see it starts out um, by already giving it some structure in some of the regions where yeah, a lot of uh, trajectories uh, for planning or uh, in the learning phase uh, have been made and where it knows a lot about. But um, especially where I uh, yeah told you or hinted you at before, in the lower part of this uh, plot, you can see again this nut and the kiwi and so on. And they are still quite close together, although all the others already look quite good. And here it takes a while for the same to really infer the relative position to each other using all the other trajectories that it has scattered and, and seen. But eventually it can do it then. And yeah, after this, uh, of course, we also uh, want to evaluate the planning capabilities of the CML. And um, this is uh, the same setup basically for the graphs. We have an arbitrary starting uh, observation and a goal observation, and we want to find a trajectory between them. But uh, now the CML really should take shortcuts. And these are also shortcuts which you just never seen uh, during the planning phase, basically. So here you can see again what the CML has uh, seen during planning and here uh, or during uh, learning. And on the right, you can see what it has, uh, what it uh, chose during planning. And these were actions that are yeah uh, novel to the, in a sense. In these, these were not previously seen state action pairs, so to say. And this is uh, solving this requires a kind of a powerful form of generalization because it's not just about statistical generalization. This really requires to discover underlying symmetries and rules of the environment and exploiting them. And um, it should be noted that the CML really uh, doesn't know what these actions mean. So it doesn't know action A means up or action C is basically down so that you cancel out. It has to figure that out by itself, which also makes it a bit different from old style self-organizing maps. And therefore it can also be applied to other types of uh, 2D environments. So for example, you could just as well apply this to hexagonal grid uh, of observations. There's uh, no limitation there. It, it could even uh, also be applied to something which is uh, not a 2D plane, but uh, rather it could be an n-dimensional environment as well. Right, and uh, with that, uh, let me show you the third uh, demo of the CML, which is yet something different. Um, here we considered a locomotion task uh, of a quadruped, which uh, is called uh, Ant, and it's from this uh, popular uh, OpenAI Gymnasium uh, Mujoku um, benchmark task set. And here we have uh, eight joints, and these uh, eight joints of this Ant are then controlled by sending torques to it. And then the environment uh, yields an observation, and this is fed back to the CML, and the CML is then predict or yeah, uh, choose the next action then. So the observations here are 29 dimensional, which means they're not 100 encoded. And uh, they also include the X and Y coordinates of the torso of this end. In the learning phase, 200 trajectories of random actions uh, were given. And uh, one of them you can see uh, looks like this. So it's really just random 
uh, wiggling of the end. And the CML really tries to make sense of these actions and integrate them into its own high dimensional state space to yeah understand um, what they what they mean. And that during the planning phase, we can now actually give it a, a diverse uh, set of tasks. So we can, for example, let it move to a target location, flee from a predator, or chase some prey. And this is possible because we just can give it different uh, target uh, observations. And this is uh, where it, uh, which makes this approach rather flexible to other uh, more classical reinforcement learning approaches, where oftentimes uh, for different tasks, different policies would be needed. Then. And yeah, here you can see some examples. So uh, yeah, the first one moves to a target. So it uh, moves uh, to the cylinder. And this is really all based on these 200 random movement trajectories. This is all it got for learning. Um, in the second video, you can see how it flees from this cube. Um, at least I hope you can see it. It's rather small, I think, but uh, probably it's possible to see it. And in the third one, um, it uh, tries to chase this uh, even smaller ball, which should represent some prey. Okay, and uh, yeah, with that, uh, uh, let me summarize. So um, the CML really creates this uh, high dimensional state space, uh, which represents the environment that it's in. And observations are mapped to points in the state space, while actions are mapped to vectors, which correspond to movement in state space. So basically they, these vectors connect different points and different uh, states, yeah. And the CML uses uh, superposition and the dot product similarity from uh, which are yeah two different uh, or two uh, important uh, VSA tools uh, for computing with high dimensional vectors. It does, however, not really use something like a binding operation or uh, permutations. And it uh, might be interesting to think about uh, if these operations uh, could be added and if they would bring some benefits to it. But yeah, right now they're not included. And yeah, the learned state space really should uh, facilitate uh, planning. That's, uh, that's the main idea. So afterwards, the CML can really find uh, arbitrary target observations. Uh, here you can see uh, the reference. And uh, yeah, last but not least, uh, let me mention that there is also some interesting follow-up work, uh, if you're interested, uh, about uh, hierarchical CMLs uh, by Nathan McDonald, who's actually here. And uh, yeah, it's about... Uh, also, it's it's uh, very interesting for this community, I think, because it also makes uh, use of a lot of uh, hyperdimensional computing ideas. Then, okay, um, yeah, thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, Christoph. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. So now I open the floor for questions. So. Let's see. Hi, thank you. Can you uh, to enlighten us which uh, type of VSA you used? Um, so I think the CML is more of a neural network which uh, uses uh, VSA-like components. Then it's I wouldn't really think of it as a VSA per se, but uh, it really has some of these properties where it um, yeah uses these. Um, the superposition principle between high dimensional vectors to really create the state space and use it for planning and then use this uh, dot product in this high dimensional space for the action selection process during planning then okay i i see thank you yeah maybe maybe one question from my side uh, just when you mentioned the superposition so you have a state and a sequence of actions that you add and this actions somehow so they they are circular so they cancel each other so yeah. how um how is this achieved this cancellation so basically this is something uh, that is uh, achieved during learning then because importantly both uh, embeddings so both uh, um these high dimensional vectors for actions and for states 
they are learned, right? Mm -hmm. So they're really uh, chosen in a way or optimized such that this is true. So uh, it's really part of the learning objective and it uh, falls yeah, out of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I had a question about how, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, question about how the the representations in the ID state space are are developed. Is there, is is that like um, manually constructed or, or, or learned? Right, this is importantly, this is learned. So um, okay. it's both, um, there are really these two components of the CML which is the positions in state space of the observations. This part is learned. And then also the correlations or the, yeah, yeah, the correlations between these uh, observations, which are the actions. So how do you get from one observation to the other? That's an action. And these uh, actions really correspond to movements in state space. So state differences in a way. And they're also learned. Okay. And and when you're talking about state space here, you mean in the in the in the is that the like the state space of its observations or is that the state space in the high D? Space? Right. When I say state space, I mean the high dimensional space yeah. of okay. the CML. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. And did you did you use any constraints on that on that high D space, like sparsity or or um, you know anything like that? We did not. Uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, what happens if we do. Yeah. That's okay. a good point. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. This is Nathan McDonald. I'll make a comment. You, the math does allow you to fix the state space. So if you had. And that was kind of my interest is if you had some hyper vectors that you wanted to use as a dictionary, you could construct your state matrix or parts of the state matrix and fix those values and train around them. But the beauty of the CML is that you could allow it to start to learn the dictionary that you later decide to play with. And then um, for, for the W or for the, the, the WQ matrix, um, as, as um, uh, Chris said, using uh, values between plus minus one, and then I might, er, for, for some of the work, would take the sign of that when I want to do calculation later, but would leave it into the, leave it as the real values for, for doing computation, and then uh, was able to work with complex numbers as well. So it's, it really think this is a cool approach and, and way to incorporate HDC with the traditional machine learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what what sort of dimensionality were you using in the in the high D state space? Um, so usually uh, we tested uh, up to like a thousand or so. Okay. So it's, it wasn't that high dimensional, I guess, but uh, for these tasks that was sufficient. Um, the, yeah, the, sorry, just uh, to mention, there is a question in the chat where uh, but, uh, the, the, there is a source code available. Uh, there isn't yet, unfortunately. Um, it's still, uh, so we're, we're still trying uh, to uh, publish this work and it's currently under review. And uh, once uh, we have it accepted, uh, the source code should be published. So we are planning on publishing it, but it's not available yet. Uh, sorry, I interrupted somebody. Uh, yeah, Dennis here. And then... uh, uh, thanks for the presentation, Chris. Uh, impressive work. And curious about you know the fact that it combines learning and randomness is 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 very interesting. And here it kind of seems that you need both, right? Because you need learning, because you you don't know a priori your environment and then it looks like you need you need randomness or orthogonality of your latent representations because that's important for the inner product for 
because right. you do sort of in a, in a product based similarity. So right. here I was curious that right now, like orthogonality, as I understand, comes from initialization. So you just initialize your uh, your embedding matrices, and that's it. Oh, but I was curious: is it now a question that's more like just out of curiosity? Question: Is orthogonality is it like a feature or is it a bias? So let's say if we somehow start with extremely non-orthogonal representations. Like, would we actually, would the system actually arrive to to kind of pseudo orthogonal ones? Would it be able to, would it, would it, is it like an important part of this representation so that even if you start from a very like non random and non orthogonal representations, you, the sort of the latent representations would kind of repel from each other to, you know, because of. Because because it's such an important property from the sort of similarity based reasoning point of view. Hmm, that's a really interesting. Question. It was it was a long one, but yeah, I was <laughs> trying to explain myself. So, I mean, I haven't tested this, so I, I can't tell for sure. But uh, uh, my hunch would be that our orthogonality is uh, important because it really filters out all other uh, actions which are not. Uh, yeah, interesting for moving towards this target uh, state. And it's really about these small breaks in our uh, in yeah, orthogonality, which um, allows this email to plan them. And uh, it's really where it's not orthogonal, uh, where it, it really can figure out that these uh, actions might be useful then. And if this is uh, tampered with, I would assume that this would lead to problems then. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That that makes perfect sense. Hmm. I, have, I have one more question if no one wants to, to ask more. Sure. We yeah, don't know the, we don't know yet. There are yeah, more. I have I can I can stay quiet for a few seconds, right? Yeah, yeah, go on. Go on. Yeah, it's, I think it's kind of the other, you know, it's almost, you know, around the same idea that it's kind of randomness versus versus structure, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the other way around. The question could be like, do you have, like, do you have to, like, do you have to start from completely random representations or is there some like very initial sort of course information about your data that you can easily you can easily get from, I don't know, like a single pass through the available data or whatever, and actually use it as your initialization point. And I I'm somehow have like vague memories. I think Chris Kim, who's in the audience here, I assume he was doing something like towards that direction with random indexing, which is, which is a technique that allows you to do like, sort of co-occurrence statistics. It allows you to very simply embed co-occurrence statistics into high dimensional representation. And like you don't really need a lot of iterations like making through your data. It's like a single pass. I mean, assuming mm -hmm. that your data is available offline, you, you can just already get good representations of data in this in a, via single pass. The question if something can be done here to, to sort of uh, improve the efficiency of uh, of training of the CML? Um, yeah, maybe. Um, I think when I was asked to look at the specific task for this and what the data then really is, um, in general, I think if one has, finds a new observation, for example, that uh, can only be, like, if you think about an abstract graph again, if you add like a new node and it, uh, has one edge going to it basically and you visit this edge you could probably just place it in state space perfectly in a single run as, as you say but uh, if you later on find out that it can be also uh, reached from other nodes you have to find a compromise and then i think you do need multiple uh, paths of iterations of learning to really uh, yeah put it into the correct place in state space if that makes sense right. I uh, just a uh, very spontaneous thought on what you and Daniel are discussing now. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to 
try the other way around. I mean, the uh, CML principles for learning initial representations uh, for random indexing purposes to get better embeddings. I don't know if it makes sense, but... Uh... Yeah, I think it's something one should probably try out and uh, see if it works then. I, uh, I mean, I could see that it, uh, it could work for the abstract graphs, I guess, yeah. But uh, um, you yeah, I guess. De de define actions and criteria in the case of text, but uh, maybe you, I mean, one could get some more reasonable embeddings in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. What, what did you say? I say that I agree. Yeah. Maybe Chris, who is uh, in the audience, can check it. <laughs> oh, hi. I hope you can hi. hear me. But yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with. I think Dennis summed up the point very well. Um, and I appreciate the I guess kind of back and forth about um whether or not you need kind of multiple passes to um refine I guess the first pass through like random indexing. Um. I think there's kind of interesting connections between like random indexing kinds of algorithms and then um, hashing algorithms. And then like one thing I've been trying to think of is like what, um, how to, I guess, reverse engineer, like what the objective function for something uh, like a random indexing algorithm uh, would be. So um, yeah, um, hope that like ties together, I guess, some of the thoughts, but I'm happy to mm -hmm. discuss further mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with anyone who's interested. Yeah, yeah sounds interesting. Uh, more comments, questions? So let's keep the silent minute or a few seconds. No one screams. But then it looks like, uh, well, it's not that we run out of questions, but uh, I think we are all happy for today anyways so i would like to thank christoph once again yeah. uh, and uh, so the recording and the slides will be available uh, online uh, as usually and i want to remind you that the next uh, vsa online webinar is scheduled in two weeks from now so the usual period between the webinars so i will see you in two weeks so thank you for coming. Yeah. See you next time. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank you guys. See ya. See ya.